Okay, thank you, Danny. You've noticed that we've got extra special staging for this morning. Do you like blue? Should, should, should we keep it? No. Nah. <laughs> no, it was a little extra challenge for setup and worship leaders, so thank you for your patience, especially when it comes to craziness that uh, you know, occasionally happens. Speaking of craziness, it was a busy week. A lot of things going on in our nation. There was, there was kind of a big election that happened on Tuesday. Now, depending on where you're at politically and so forth, you may be happy, you may be not so happy, or maybe you're somewhere indifferent in the middle wondering if anything really changes anyway. I think it's appropriate that we spend a moment in prayer this morning. Wherever you fit on that spectrum, there, it, it goes without saying that changes happen with new administrations, and especially new congresses. So we need to have the proper mindset and focus as believers when it comes to how we respond to those that the Lord has placed in authority over us. So wherever you're at, will you join with me in a brief moment of prayer? Lord, we're grateful that your word instructs us in the right way to move forward, that even though the conditions of... of uh, the, the, uh, the New Testament and the gospel and under Roman rule, things were different. There are still things that we can apply today. So Lord, we pray that first of all, as First Peter tells us, that we would fear you, that we would revere you, that we would place our hearts and minds and focus upon you no matter who is in the White House and no matter what our Congress looks like. I would pray, Lord, as believers, we would set the tone and the standard so that those who are around us, happy, sad, or wherever they may be, can see that within us, within our church, within our lives, that there is a different standard that raises us up to a different level that even transcends the politics of our nation. So we pray, Lord, that we would be people that would fear and revere the name of the Lord first. And also, Lord, as First Peter says, that we would honor those authorities, even the emperor, as Peter tells us. We don't have an emperor right now, but we're about to have a new president. So we pray, Lord, that in response to what is happening and the policies around us, we would give the president and the Congress, those in, in authority over us, the honor that is due their office. And we would pray that we would do that in a way that, again, would show that there is something different about us, that there is a sweet aroma from those who are saved that know and have that kind of confidence that we know what we're about and we know where we're headed regardless of the changes. So we pray, Lord, that fear of you honoring the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, setting aside the proper respect for our authorities would mark us as believers. Now, Lord, be with us as we dig into your psalm, as we uncover and, and pull out truth from it that is needed in our lives today. Guide us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Psalm 103, another one of my favorites. We sang about it. I don't know if you picked that up. A couple of our songs this morning had to do and really come right out of Psalm 103. Psalm 103 begins with, bless the Lord, O my soul. It repeats it, David repeats it twice, and then he says it four more times at the end of the psalm. So why does he say this? Why does the Lord need blessing? I remember the first time I was a youth pastor, we were singing some song about bless the Lord, and one of the students said, well, why do we bless the Lord? What, is the, what does God need from us? And uh, I didn't know what to say in the moment, because that really wasn't on my script, right? I, we're doing other things, and, but wow, what a really good question. And I think it deserves a really good answer. Irish scholar J. Alec Motyer says this, so I'm quoting him because I think he said it really well. When the Lord blesses us, he reviews our needs and responds to them. That's the way that we're used to using the word blessing, okay? It's something we receive from the Lord. But when we bless the Lord, we review His excellencies and we respond to them. That's what we sang about this morning. His excellencies is how we put it, or His benefits. 
That's what we do as we begin with Psalm 103 this morning. So it's benefit review time. Maybe you've done that in your job. Every, maybe it's part of your annual review where you stop and consider what it is that your employer is giving you, the benefits that are due your contract, your job description. So maybe you're used to that. We're going to put that aside, and we are going to engage as believers now. What is it that we can review as far as the benefits that come our direction because of the grace of God? Now, we don't have all of them. We just have a few of them here in front of us this morning that we need to look at. Verse 3, David dwells on a number of these things, and we'll begin with verse 3. He forgives all my iniquity. This benefit is one, what all the other benefits spring out of in this psalm. He, forgets, he forgives all my iniquity. David also uses the word sins and transgressions in this psalm, but notice this. David used the word all, and if that didn't grab your attention when we read it before, it should grab your attention now. He doesn't just forgive part of the ones that aren't quite so bad. When we consider the, what we've received from the Lord, we remember this. He forgives all of them without reservation. God doesn't stop and say, nope, this one or that one I'm going to hold on to. He forgives all all of them. Also in verse 3, he heals all your diseases. What is David speaking of there? Well, here, this is what it is. Many diseases that he is talking about that we see occurring in the original Testament are brought on the people by, them, by themselves, by their own actions. They are a result of the curses that are conditions that are related to the negligence or the rejection of the law, blessings and curses come with the law of the original Testament, okay? If you reject the law, curses come and they are on you, so to speak. They are because you have rejected the Lord. Now, the, this kind of self-inflicted suffering, the Lord sees, the Lord is aware of, and he doesn't look at you and say, ha, ah, you got what you're coming or what was coming to you. David says he sees me, and he says he heals, once again, the word all. All of those things that you brought on yourself, the Lord is aware of, and he forgives all of them and heals all of them. Verse 4, he redeemed your life from the pit. The Lord looks down into the pit. Imagine actually digging yourself a hole. You're familiar with that phrase, right? Digging a hole you can't get yourself out of. We're, you know, the, the metaphor is here. Maybe it is even not even a metaphor. Maybe you're actually doing it right now. Sometimes we dig that hole so deep we can't even see our way out. What do we do with that? The Lord redeems. He, the, the idea is purchasing back. He pays the price to reach into the pit that you dug and grabs a hold of you and pulls you out because of his grace. Also, verse 4, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I love the wording that David uses here. Once out of the pit of your own making, he takes a crown gleaming with newness. It's an honor, really. If you have a crown placed on your head, it's an honor reserved only for kings and queens and princes and princesses. And for you, who the Lord loves. He pulls you out and says, I'm going to put a crown in your head, but it's not a medal. It's not some precious metal like gold or silver. He adorns you with what he describes as a steadfast mercy and the love of the Lord, setting you apart, honored as, as it is. And then also in verse 5, David says, he satisfies you with good. What does it look like? to be satisfied, truly, completely, deeply satisfied with good. Now, think of this. Have you ever been to a desert? There are a number of uh, national parks where you can actually get into desert-like situations and conditions. You don't have to go to Sahara, Gobi, or whatever. You can be in the middle of a desert situation so large that, and so desolate with the heat and the dirt and the sand, maybe a cactus here and there, but that's it. You can get in the middle of a place like that and feel hopeless because everything is parched and dry and lifeless. 
A ground like that needs only a, one good storm where the rain comes down and suddenly, out of nothing, you can see grass and wildflowers and life and animals begin to come out of nowhere. All it takes is that one rain to satisfy parched, empty, dead ground to bring life. God looks at you and he knows the lifelessness that you have apart from him and says, I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to bring rain. I'm going to bring grace. I'm going to bring all that is that you need, the benefits that you didn't deserve, but I freely choose to give to bring lifeless ground, desert land to life. That is part of the benefit of knowing the Lord. Now, without his, without his benefits, our lives are spiritual deserts. Nothing springs up. Nothing moves forward, void of life. But with his benefits applied, we begin to see life come to place. Now, he goes on to, to describe an eagle soaring, as it were, on wings that are renewed, that there's new life in those wings. <clears throat> that is what that new life in Christ, in the, the blessings and the benefits of God, that's what it looks like. The eagle is a metaphor, soaring, giving a picture of strength and grace. When you're satisfied in the Lord, you soar. That's what David is speaking of. That is his point of view this morning. That's the beginning of the benefit package that we have when we know the Lord. Now, do you know that benefit package? That's the first time, that's the first place we need to stop this morning and consider and think. If this is the first time you've heard of this, or maybe perhaps it has been a while because the cares of life, the things that are going on begin to encroach and the pressure and the stress and whatever, we've got to take time to review. And it's not good enough to wait for the pastor on Sunday morning to review your benefit package with you. You've got to take time to open up God's word. Many times we say this. Many times Danny, Danny says it, I think, almost every Sunday. Take time to open up God's word. If you've got one of those fancy study Bibles, perfect place to start. If you don't have one, go get one. I'll, I'll recommend one for you. Find some cross-references. Every one of those benefits that I just read in Psalm 103, find the cross-references. Where else do these appear in Scripture? Why does it appear there? What am I learning about this example, this person? Maybe a type of Christ. Maybe something else is going on. Enrich your life and feel the true benefit of knowing Christ and the power of his word active in you. Have you done that recently? You will feel lifeless if you don't. You will. That is an absolute guarantee. You will struggle every day, whether it's temptation or confusion or distraction or hopelessness, whatever it is, you will struggle guaranteed unless you constantly refresh and allow God's word to bring life back to places that are dead and empty. David does this. We've already thought about David. We reviewed some of the things of David's life. We know the places where he's been in and where he's been at and the sin that he's committed. And brother, there have been a lot of them. But here he pauses and he remembers what it is that is so good about the benefits of knowing the Lord God and how those overcome all of that other stuff in the past. Nothing compares to the benefits of knowing God the Lord, which is why he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits that I receive. Are you in that place? Now, that really should be the end of the sermon, but it's not. Okay, so we're going to move on. Now, what does it look like to know these benefits? Do you ever, so here's what we're going to do. Each one of those benefits could be a whole sermon series in and of themselves because they're that rich and they're that deep and we need them so much. David focuses in on this psalm on one of them and what it means and what it looks like to be forgiven. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you ever struggle in your life if you know Christ as Savior, you have a relationship with God, but do you ever struggle with knowing that you're really forgiven? Do you believe that you're forgiven? There are some times where you, you struggle with, am I, today, 
because of whatever. I don't really feel like I'm forgiven. Do you struggle with that? Here's another question. Related, do you struggle forgiving someone else? Have there been the depth of the wrong that you've experienced in your life, does it continue to influence you and twist your heart and make it hardened? Are there some people, because of certain situations, whether they're in, in your circle of, of daily contact or not, but just the thought, and they, and they, and they especially when we struggle with forgiveness, the thought of somebody... It, it tends to pop up maybe maybe every day. If, have you been in that place? Boom. You could be doing something. You're going on your way. You're taking care of business. Something in the back of your head pops up. Remember this person? Remember what they did to you? And it just twists your heart. Have you been in that situation? That's tough. I'm not saying it's easy, but I believe this psalm speaks to both our, our struggle with knowing and believing that we're forgiven and what it means to truly forgive other people and having the resources and the place to do that. So I'm going to have my Bible out here. I don't have all these verses on, on the screen. If you have Psalm 103 in your device, in your Bible, whatever, turn to that. I'm going to refer to some of the verses. We didn't read the entire Psalm this morning in our responsive reading. So some of those verses I'm going to pull out for us now to think about, okay? We're going to start with the verses 14 through 16. What does it look like? to know the benefits of forgiveness. Verses 14 through 16. David says this, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting and everlasting on those who fear him. Let's pause there for a moment. The benefits of, of his forgiveness. He knows, because he's created you, he knows your limitations, and this is a good thing, not a bad thing. It kind of sounds like a bad thing. As for man, his days are like grass. Wind passes over it. It's gone. You're only here for a short period of time. <laughs> you may live it up, or you may struggle with your existence and with the life that God has given you, but no matter who you are, it's going to end. You came from dust, and you're going to go back to it. Ouch. Right? Where's the happiness in that? The Lord reminds us of that through David so that we can find comfort in that. The Lord knows that. He's not surprised by our limitations, our frailties, the finite nature of, the, of why we struggle with the things we struggle with, he knows that. He's aware of that. And he doesn't judge us because we're finite in his infinite abilities. So just remember that. That's a good starting place for us this morning. Secondly, he drops the charges that are against us. Verses 9, uh, 9 and 10. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our, our iniquities. Nobody uses the word chide anymore. I don't know why ESV chose to use the word chide. He will not always chide. He's not, in other, in other words, he's not going to continue to accuse us in court. He could, without Christ, he could prosecute us and find us guilty, but the Lord in the psalm says, I could do that, but I choose not to. So what does the Lord do with our sins? Verses 11 through 17, he removes them. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Those sins are no longer in view. Why is it so hard to believe those words? Do you struggle with those words? In, in the poetic grandeur of them, it, it, you can't miss it. How do you measure the east from the west? You can't. There you go. That's what the Lord does for you as you return to him. How can that possibly be? In case, and in case you missed that, he uses a different metaphor. As a father shows compassion to his children, 
Now, some of us struggle with our dads, right? That isn't always a good picture from our past. For those of us who can connect to that, and I am grateful and thankful that I can, I know a father, I had a father who was compassionate towards me. Sure, he had limitations, but one thing I know, man, he put up a lot of junk for me. He showed compassion when I didn't deserve it. As a father shows compassion, so the Lord so much more so shows compassion as I respond to him, as I honor him, as I fear him, as the original testament says. So great is his love towards us that he removes in that way. David only has a foggy view of what that means and how that could happen. He knows the law. He knows the sacrificial system. That only covers in part. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, he speaks of a time where there's going to be a new covenant coming. The old covenant was going to pass away. It's going to be finished or fulfilled. That new covenant will come where God says through Jeremiah, all my laws are going to be written on your hearts. Everyone's going to know me personally, directly from the heart. And there. Uh, Jeremiah says, from God, I will remember your sins no more. Through that intermediary whom we know now, David didn't know clearly, Jeremiah didn't understand completely, whom we know now to be Jesus Christ. He enters into the place where we were lost without him and chooses to act to remove our sin from us. That's the vertical experience that we have with the Lord God because of and through Jesus Christ. Here's how Paul describes this experience in the book of Colossians. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. These he set aside, Nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them even to open shame by triumphing over them in him. We are prone to forget that, that the triumph is God. We get to join in the procession because of Jesus Christ. What they never understood, we can live in. And as the psalmist proclaims, we can even more joyfully say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Because I was dead. My heart was done. It was cold. It was hard. It was lifeless. And you brought new life into me. Do you know Jesus like that? Where he canceled your sin. And you can say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Now, let's get back to forgiveness. These verses, this psalm has everything to do with forgiveness. And the joy that you have when you know you're forgiven. Knowing his benefits produces things that relate to forgiveness that we need to talk about a little bit here. <clears throat> Tim Keller uses these two different terms, and I'll put them on the screen for you, as he speaks about uh, forgiveness in his book, <clears throat> excuse me, Forgive, How Should I and How Can I? I think it was the last book that he wrote before he died. Forgiveness How should I and how can I? The benefits that are produced from knowing the Lord in the way that David knows and the way we can know as followers of Jesus Christ produce both spiritual humility and spiritual confidence. What does spiritual humility mean? This past Wednesday, my friend Duncan came to City Teens and he talked about his life. Uh, Maybe you've met him. He was at our fall retreat. He's not here this morning. I asked permission. He said, yes, I could talk about him. He grew up in a church, had Christian parents, was involved in all sorts of church activities, knew plenty about the Bible, had verses memorized. All He had a fine church pedigree as a child, right? He knew it all, or at least he thought he did. And then got into all sorts of trouble as he pursued a path of addiction, trying to fill what he knew was a void and emptiness in his heart, in his life, tried to fill it up with other things. And not until he began to finally realize that knowing about God and knowing about verses in the Bible and knowing church-related activities and things, that could never fill him up, that what he needed was what he never had. 
a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that, as he spoke, and as he's spoken to me many times, brought him to a place of true spiritual humility. He knew he needed what he could not provide for himself. And that, friends, and if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about, that, can, that does humble you into the dirt. I can't do it, no matter how hard I try. A lot, a lot of that in his story, Duncan's story, had to do with addiction. But you don't have to be addicted to a chemical to realize your need for being humbled before Christ. Can't do it. When you come to that point, you can then begin to realize not only the gift of salvation, but what it means to continue to come back to Christ to seek forgiveness. What does Scripture say? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's what? Do you know this verse? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Two different ideas that John brings out. He is faithful and he's just. Now, faithfulness, that brings us back to ideas that are already presented in the original Testament, steadfast love and faithfulness. That continues. But he is also just. He must, because he is just, forgive us because of what Christ has done. He cannot do otherwise. He is faithful to who he is and what he's always been, and he's just. He will deliver justice because when he looks at us, he knows and sees what Jesus did for us. Do you remember that? Do you remember that when you come to that time of confession, of renewing yourself, when, when you confess your sins before, before Christ. Now, how do you know if you're actually confessing? Ran across a, an article by C.S. Lewis. It's an essay uh, on forgiveness. And I thought his words were just absolutely great. Because you can come to that verse, if we confess our sins, it's basically, you know, you can, you can approach that verse using it in a way that becomes more and more lifeless, like you can do with any verse, Right? You can approach asking forgiveness in a way that doesn't really truly involve your heart. So how is it that you know that you're confessing? This uh, just brief quote from this essay I thought was really great. C.S. Lewis came to realize that when he asked God to forgive him, he was really asking God to excuse him. Now this is where you have to think and consider where your heart is. When he thought he was confessing, he was really asking for an excuse. He wrote this in his essay on forgiveness. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology. These are C.S. Lewis's words, okay? I will never hold it against you, and everything between us two will be exactly what it was before. But excusing says, I see that you couldn't help it or didn't mean it, you weren't really to blame. Do you see the difference there? If I approach Christ like, I just need your excuse again, then I'm really saying, I just need to get out of what I, you know, the guilt that I feel right now. I don't really want to confess. I just want to feel better. You see the difference? But do you see also what he says about confession? Now, I will add to what he says this. Our approach when it comes to confessing our sins before Christ and others, really, has to, has to involve telling the truth. And it's brutal honesty. Because that, again, brings spiritual humbleness to our hearts. When I confess, here's the practice I try to, to remain constant in. When I come to Christ, when I ask for forgiveness, I own up to my sin. When I sinned, Lord, I did it willingly because I wanted to. That's humbling. To say that and mean it, that kind of confession, you're revealing, Christ knows my heart, but he needs to know that I know what's going on when I confess. Tell the truth. The same thing with your relationship with other people, right? When I, when I or oh, what's, the, what's the one thing we need to, to avoid? If you felt something, then I'm sorry, right? Have you heard that before? Is that really asking for forgiveness? No. You, to, to really ask for forgiveness, you own it. 
You know what you did. So own up to it and say it. I did such and such. In light of that, and I did it willingly, in light of that, will you forgive me? That is true humility. That is what it is that Christ asks for us. Spiritual humility in true, deeper confession. Now, that's only part of what we're going through into here. If all you experience is that kind of spiritual humility, then how can you have what it takes to move forward in life and actually finding forgiveness, knowing forgiveness, especially in our relationship with other people? That's where this idea of spiritual confidence, or you could say spiritual wealth, comes into play. It's tough to confront or to forgive if you feel too needy or insecure to even bring it up, right? That's tough. It introduces all sorts of complications in our relationships. What will they do to me? What will they think of me? What will their response be? To be in a place where it's only humility puts us in a pretty tough place. Now, if you know God the way David knows God, you have what is, I would say, a growing experience of spiritual wealth and confidence. If I know that he means what he says, then I stand in a whole different position before God. And because I stand in that position before God, I can stand before you with a kind of spiritual wealth and confidence that I never knew before. Because you know what? There's nothing you can do to me. <laughs> that's, what a, that's the kind of relationship I have with God. No matter what you do, or no matter what your response is, or maybe you'll choose to reject me. I still stand confident knowing what it is that the Lord has done for me and my relationship with God. Somebody can try to hit you when it hurts, but it doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't hurt anymore because what I have transcends that interaction because I've been so completely forgiven in Christ. Now, I'm going to put somebody else on the spot. Tressa okayed me telling her story this morning. So I'm going to give you just a brief idea of something that we talked about recently. She was stuck in a very difficult situation with people that she is close to at a very emotionally charged time. Now, it would have been easy for her to withdraw or to avoid or to come into that situation where I can't handle this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Or to even respond in bitterness or anger. I'm going to pull away and let it all fall down. But in the moment of truth, so to speak, she discovered what she needed that she was able to draw from. There's no magic potion when it comes to being found faithful in Christ and knowing that he's faithful to you. It's not a mere emotionally driven response, but she discovered an inner confidence that gave her strength to say what was needed while not giving in to the pressure to absorb the wrongdoing on herself. She discovered that Christ was sufficient. Glory to God. Or even we could say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's a sweet place to be in. That kind of confidence that I know I can handle it because Christ is in me. Again, we are turned to, turn to C.S. Lewis. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Did you catch that? One more time. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. How in the world do I do that? To find the inner strength and confidence because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. That's where Psalm 103 leads us towards. World War II, Corey Ten Boom. Ever heard her name? Uh, a Dutch resistance person. Her and her family hid uh, Jewish people who were trying to flee Nazi Germany. The Ten Booms were eventually found out. They were interred in a concentration camp. Corey and her sister spent, uh, I can't remember how much time together, before her sister eventually died, but Corey survived that experience, went on to write and to speak, and became someone who was uh, powerfully used by Christ 
to speak into many lives, especially in areas where it concerned forgiveness. She went through hellish situations in internment concentration camps, and she lived to tell the story of how God was sufficient, not just to get her through that experience, but how God enabled her through the strength and the wealth of, of, of his indwelling in her, enabling her to actually forgive the people that tortured her. Quick quote. Corey says, I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there in the German concentration camp. Everything around us was dark and there was darkness in my heart. Who wouldn't say that in that kind of a similar situation? I remember telling Betsy, who's her sister, that I thought God has forgotten us. No, Corey, said Betsy, he has not forgotten us. Remember his word, which we've read this morning. For as high as the heavens are, for, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And Corey says this, there is an ocean of God's love available. There is plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love whatever the circumstances. Now I realize using an illustration for World War II is tough, right? We don't have Nazis around us and we're not in concentration camps. But I love how Corey finishes that thought. Whatever the circumstances, there are times in all of our lives where we feel like we're put into a place that we don't wanna be. How in the world do we respond? How, how can we live? How can we then even dare to extend forgiveness to, forgiveness to those who have wronged us? Remember the ocean of love that never runs dry. Remember what it is that we have, the benefits we have from the Lord in our relationship with Him. Remember that because He excused the in, uh, unforgivable in us, then we have the resources necessary and possible to forgive and extend love to others. Do you know Jesus like that? Find the inner confidence that only he can provide. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for what it is that you have done, that we can stand before you, we can sing songs like what we've sung this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. We forget not your benefits. Enable us, Lord, to go from this place all the more certain and secure in what it is that you've provided for us. We bless you, Lord, because we've received them. We bless you again that we get to move forward confident in you. Lord Jesus, as we sing, as we consider your promises, and if there are areas that are dark or confused or frustrated when it comes to knowing and understanding your forgiveness, I pray that even as we're singing or as we share at the end of our service, that this could be a time that we can understand better, see more clearly, hear with the, with the ears of our hearts to understand your gospel truth as it pertains to our lives. Change our hearts so we can stand in your gospel certainty. In Jesus' name, amen.